Hello YouTube, this is Matt Pullen, and this is a position from my game in round two of the Cardinal Open in Ohio last weekend. And this is my game against Alex Friends. I had white pieces. And things to notice about this end game: white has two more pawns than black, so a two-pawn advantage, but most of the pawns are on the same side of the board. So there is still some work to do to find a win here. I also have a bishop against his knight. So this pawn on d5, it's a passed pawn, but he's blockading it very nicely with his king on d6. And my bishop is on the wrong color square to attack d6. So the pawn on d5 is a liability for me. I decide that I would like to trade this pawn on d5 for the pawn on g5. Because even though you're trading pawns, which uh, you usually shouldn't do if you're ahead material, you want to trade pieces and not pawns. But trading pawns in this case would get rid of my weakest pawn. And it would also give me two connected passed pawns, which are extremely valuable in an endgame, especially against a knight. So if king takes, then I play rook takes check. And in this position the move that I would have selected would be bishop to f5 because I want to maintain this dominating relationship of the bishop and the knight. And what I mean by dominating relationship is that the bishop is two squares away from the knight. And what this does is the bishop is attacking half of the knight's squares. d7, e6, e4, and d3 are all controlled by my bishop. So he, if he moves the knight to any of those squares, I can take it. So by using this relationship of the bishop two squares away from the knight, it's like you're, uh, you're attacking half the knight's squares. So, so this is a relationship uh, that I would like to try to maintain. If you re recall here, in the beginning, my bishop was two squares away from his knight, controlling the squares a4, b3, d3, and e4. It's an extremely useful tool in an endgame if you have a bishop against a knight to put your bishop two squares away from the knight so that you're uh, cutting the knight's scope in half. But he did not capture. He played rook to g8. And now I take advantage of the fact that the g-pawn is pinned and I play pawn to f4. And this forces an, end game, an ending, which I have to calculate before I play pawn to f4. So black cannot capture this because of his unprotected rook on g8, but he can take this pawn. And now I play rook takes check because I certainly want to trade rooks in an endgame like this, but I need to calculate that the resulting ending is a win. And I decided that yes, it is a win because I have the plan of moving my king to uh, the h-file and supporting the advance of my pawns this way, for instance king to e5, king f3, knight e6, king g4. And my idea is to bring my king around the edge, h5 and h6, and then support the advance of my pawn. So, that is what he could have played. But instead he played knight to e6, which on the surface is a good move, because it attacks this pawn. And if I push the pawn, then he can blockade on a color square that my bishop cannot attack. So this would be a very difficult ending for me to win. But instead, after knight e6, I see, okay, his king and knight are in a line. I could check and trade the bishop for the knight. But first, I need to make sure that the resulting pawn ending is a win for me. And maybe you can pause and make sure yourself that, uh, White's ending with the two doubled pawns is a win. So yes, I decided it is, and I check on b3, and then I trade. And bring my king in, and then he brings his king in to f5, and now in this position, white must lose a pawn, because there's no way to support the pawn on uh, g5. But what is the best way to lose a pawn? It might be tempting to some players to push the pawn for check. But in this position, uh, this would be bad. 
And my motto in King and Pawn Endgames is, pushing a pawn for check is almost always bad. The only way that you should push a pawn for check is if you control the next two or three squares in the pawn's path to the queening square, and that's clearly not the case here. After king takes pawn, king g3, king g6 is a book draw. So, the best way to lose a pawn in this position is pawn to g6. And uh, in this position, I just played pawn to g6 right away. I never really considered pushing the pawn for check. So, king takes, and now I get the opposition by playing king to g4. And in this position, if black had the opposition, that is, if it were white's move, then this would be a draw. But it's black's move, and he has to give ground. If he comes this way, then I just gain ground with my king, controlling the square g6. But he went this way, and I also controlled g6. So he moved back, and I take the opposition again. And he went to g8, and I took the opposition again. He moved to the corner. I pushed my pawn twice. And this position right here, this position that I've achieved with uh, the king on the sixth rank and the pawn behind it, this is a win no matter whose move it is. It's black's move, and he played king to h8, and I played king to f7, controlling the next three squares in the pawn's path to the queening square. So after king h7, I pushed the pawn for check, and he resigned, because I'm going to get a queen, g7, g8 queen, no matter what. So this position, I would actually like to do something here, look at a variation of this. I'm going to make it white's move here. So it's white's move. This pawn ending is still a win, but you need to find the right move here. g6 is stalemate, because the black king's unique position in the corner. Any, uh, any other position for the king, like if you moved all the pieces one square to the left, then this would be a win, because the king would need to go away to the uh, right side, and then I just keep pushing the pawn and make a queen. But this is stalemate because the king is not in check and has no squares to move to. So that would be a draw. So another wrong move would be king to f6. Because in this position, black could play king to h7. And now white is nothing better than to repeat with king f7. If the pawn push, then uh, black has two legal moves, and if he finds the right one, he draws. This one, g8, would be wrong, because pawn to g7, the king has one legal move, and now king f7 and the pawn queens. But instead, black's king could go to h8. And now, if king f7, this is stalemate. So, what about pushing the pawn? Well, king g8, and now this is a draw, because uh, the white king either has to leave the pawn or play king g6, which is stalemate. Notice, in this position, this is what I was talking about, pushing the pawn for check. Pushing the pawn for check is bad when you don't control the squares in front of the pawn. So, so this in this position, if the uh, pawn push, then king h8, and now uh, if the white king just tries to go somewhere else, then king g7 and black has a draw. So, so in this position, pushing the pawn is wrong. The only way is to repeat position with king f7, king h8, and we have the same position we had before, but we saw that uh, king f6 is wrong. So king g6, and the idea here is we're just going to move to the other square, other side of the pawn, where I can push this pawn, and it's not stalemate, because the king has board to go to on the left side. So in this position, the king would have to go here, and then king h7, and then promotes next. So black should resign here. Well, I hope this has given you an idea of uh, evaluating pawn endings 
and gaining the opposition. Also, something you should take from this video is that pushing pawns for check in a pawn ending is bad unless you control the squares in front of the pawn. Well, thank you for watching this video and have a good one.